I've been enamored with Root basically ever since I got in the hobby. And in fact, I can remember the first time I discovered Root. <laughs> just gotten a fresh copy of Wingspan and I was completely blown away by the gameplay and the production. I'd never seen anything like it. So like I do with basically everything in my life, I start to obsess over it. And the best place to obsess over something, of course, is YouTube, which is naturally why I do it now. <laughs> Either way, I found an interview between Elizabeth Hargraves and Quackalope. And then later that night, I started to dive into Quackalope's channel and I saw tons of content on this weird looking game called Root and I started to watch the playthroughs and I started to become more and more interested. Obviously the juxtaposition of cute woodland creatures and war and them destroying each other was interesting. Of course, how do you see that and not be at least a little bit intrigued? But for me, that wasn't all of it. Part of it, and in fact, a lot of it was watching these gameplays of four people around a table playing these factions that played completely differently. And in fact, as I watched these games, I still couldn't really figure out what they were doing. The table talk associated with each of these games, the stories that were essentially created as they played each of these games were so different. I just became obsessed. So I put it on my Christmas list and I waited. And eventually Santa came to town and I got Root. And my wife being the wonderful wife that she is, felt an obligation to help me get this thing to the table. And we did, we, we got it to the table and we played the classic Marquis versus Eerie and I had a blast. She not so much, she bounced off it. She had not watched the tens of hours of Root coverage that I did. So she didn't understand what the possibilities were here. She didn't understand all of the different factions and how they can be interesting and how you can create these stories in each and every game. And she didn't understand that because we didn't do that. The gameplay, if I'm honest, wasn't very interesting. It was very one-sided. And we might've gotten to the table together like one or two times. Maybe I brought a kid in for a three-player playthrough. But in general, it just hit with a thud in my house. And frankly, I was kind of devastated. I kind of built up this game in my head as being something that I would absolutely love. And I just couldn't get it to the table because it wasn't interesting. My gaming group didn't like it. That was years ago at this point. And I recently made a video of games that I wish I could play more of. And Root was obviously on there. The good people at Leader Games came in and have provided me with a review copy of the Marauders expansion because it promises to maybe not fix, but greatly help the two player experience. So I got it. I played it. And I'm going to tell you now, did it deliver on its promise? So in doing research for this video, I found a design diary where Cole Worley gives a baseline explanation as to why this expansion was created and what problems it was solving for. In the diary, Cole describes a couple of the classic matchups, the Erie and Marquis being one in which can be a close game, but the Erie have a significant advantage, can overwhelm the Marquis pretty easily. The Marquis needs to set up properly and basically play a perfect game to compete. With the Eerie and the Duchy, the Duchy are easily favored because they can get around the Eerie and the board state basically stays empty the entire time. He goes on to state his design goals and instead of paraphrasing, I'll read them exactly. These early cases gave me a few general design goals. First, the board was simply too empty. There's a reason why the cats improve pretty much any game they're in and that reason has to do with their setup. Their thin line of warriors throughout the woods provide a baseline friction and texture to the map that just isn't there when the map's empty. I needed the two player game to not be so empty. He goes on, the second design goal had to do with addressing those early knockouts. A player in a weak position needed some viable path to bounce back. This is one reason why I didn't like approaching the problem with a smaller map. The issue was not that the map was too big, the issue was that the game's ecosystem was too empty. There wasn't enough shrubbery to hide behind and regroup. And that brings us to the two player conundrum. How do you make a two player game of Root feel like the board is more crowded and interesting with different types of potential abilities sitting out there waiting to check your progress? And how do we stop the eventual steamrolling of one player? Does the Marauders expansion solve those problems? Let's get into it. And we're going to start with the factions and enter the Keepers in Iron. That is a faction that I immediately fell in love with. I think in general, it's accepted as a pretty complex faction, if not one of the absolute most complex. Their goal is really to expand a network throughout the forest and go and delve into adjacent forests to grab relics 
and bring those relics back to a way station that they'd built. Really, it's a pick up and deliver game and their action economy is based upon some programming components. It's not as punishing as the game the Eerie is trying to play, but it's still programming nonetheless. The risk there comes if they delve an item that has a value that's higher than the number of clearings you control adjacent to that relic, then you lose the action card you use to go and delve and get that item. So there's some friction there. There's an idea of wanting to expand your network in a thoughtful way to delve and grab the relics and and mitigate your chances of losing those action cards. And on top of that, they get some extra defense if they're holding one of their relic items, which is also kind of a fun little wrinkle, and which helps to keep the 100 in check. Enter the Lord of the 100. Lord of the 100 is a much more straightforward faction, I think. It's really command and conquer. You're trying to go forth and destroy everything with mob tokens and clearings, so then you can rule them absolutely. Because you gain points based upon the number of these clearings you own with no other enemy pieces in them. There is a little more nuance here and their kind of action economy is largely based upon the number of items that they've crafted and stored on their board, which they didn't take points for. But the, the fun part with them is depending on which items have been crafted and are on your board, limits the mood cards that you can play on your board. You see, the Lord of the Hundred comes with a bevy of moods, all of which give you special powers. And if you've crafted an item that is also seen on one of these cards, you can no longer use that as one of your moods. You're constantly changing your moods as you go along, which creates a unique puzzle out on your board, even though your goals are pretty straightforward. You just want to go and destroy everything. They also have really great ability to duplicate and overwhelm opponents. And really they want to own half of the board. Total ownership of six clearings allows you to maximize your points of four. If you're averaging three to four points, the game is over in eight to nine turns. That's kind of their win condition. They want to own half of that map completely. The Badgers, on the other hand, certainly need to expand out as much as possible. So this naturally brings them together in the middle and there is certainly conflict. But largely this matchup can stay on two halves of a map with minimal or relatively low interaction, certainly more so than if you were playing an insurgent faction and a militant faction. But really like the Keepers and Iron, they're cut off from one forest if Lord of the Hundred own half of the board. So worst case scenario with the keepers is they're cut off from two tokens at max that could be worth six points. If they happen to be the same token, they're losing on some bonus points. What I didn't mention before is that if you complete full columns of these relics for each column, you get an extra two points. So they could technically be cut off from about 10 points. Naturally, they can score 35 just by collecting all of their relics, both on the point value of the relic and all of the bonus points. So they're sitting at 25 points and really need to go into that forest to get those extra points if they want to collect all the relics. Certainly there's ways around that. They could craft cards and removing the enemy pieces can obviously get you some points as well, which has these factions really at a minimum have to interact. And if the keepers and iron are smart, they're gonna go into the Lord controlled clearings and cause some havoc. We played our first games using these two factions, no hirelings whatsoever. And we had fun. I thought they were great. I loved playing Keepers in Iron. My son loved playing Lord of the Hundreds. We had some pretty good battles, but does it fix the two player game? Sadly, no, it doesn't. It certainly helps. It gives you two factions that have to interact with one another. They will fill out a board, at least half of a board each essentially. But in the end, it still is a fairly predictable game that you're replaying over and over. Then we added the hirelings and I can tell you those completely changed the game.
The hirelings I got in the Marauders expansion are representative of the four baseline factions. Basically, the way the hirelings work is you choose three of them, and in a two-player game, all of them are on kind of their active side, which is kind of the most powerful and interesting side. So you're going to have lots of interesting interactions throughout the board. But the way that they go, essentially, is the leader in points will get the first crack at using each one of them. Uh, I believe it's four, eight, and 12 points. The first person to get to each of those thresholds gets to take control of a hireling of their choice and they roll a control die and they put the number of contracts equal to the gold pips on the die and they can use them that number of turns. The interesting thing is these hirelings tend to become more powerful, at least in our experience, throughout the game. Take the Exile, which is essentially the Vagabond. It's this bear that roams around through forests like the Vagabond, and it has an action economy based upon crafted items. It starts with three of them, which is really limited, but you can invest and put your previously crafted items on to the bear and you score a point, get an extra card. So it's certainly an incentive to be able to do so. But then it also gives the exile a greater action economy to have more mobility and get into the enemy territory and then be able to score the max number of hits. So it becomes more and more powerful. The interesting part though, is at most you can have it two turns and then you have to turn it over to the next player. So you can build up this exile as much as you want, but you know, the position you leave it in is the position that you're going to get attacked from. So there's a lot of tactical thought around where you're placing that. The Forest Patrol, which is the proxy for the Marquis de Cat, starts just like the Marquis. They have a thin presence across the entire board. So immediately you have friction everywhere and you're wondering if those pieces are going to be used against you. It depends on if you get control or not early, but the longer you go, the more those cats can become consolidated, the more dangerous they that they're going to get. So the person that's controlling them out of the gates isn't necessarily the person that's gonna get the biggest hits on them. So that's once again, part of the game. Like I'm, I'm moving these pieces around to go and attack the other person, but they're going to be used against me at one turn or another. So it's this secondary meta game that's happening with each of these factions. Then you have the last dynasty, proxy to the Eerie. They're a ball of war coming at you, starting in a corner and doing what the Eerie do, pretty straight straightforward, but once again, they're going to be used against you. So if you're bringing them into clearings that can be used against you later on, they're going to. So it's another friction point in the game. And then you have the Spring Uprising, clearly the proxy for Woodland Alliance. They're actually really interesting. You have to roll a die and then place one of the pieces into a matching clearing if there is not one. However, if there is already one in a matching clearing, it blows up all the enemy pieces. You remove everything. So they are a ticking time bomb, just like in the regular game, but they add that sense of complete chaos. It doesn't always feel perfectly fair. It definitely gives you a much more interesting game. And no longer is the board state kind of a half and half board state with some light interaction in the middle. We found that the board state was constantly changing, ever evolving, the board control is flipping from one side to the other based upon how these hirelings are acting. You're running your character and then also these hirelings, they definitely make the decisions more crunchy. They add presence everywhere. They add friction everywhere. They add danger everywhere. And they also add opportunity everywhere. Bottom line, it fixed the game for me. The factions that come in Marauders are wonderful. I absolutely love them. I love to play both of them. But at the end of the day with two players, it still created a pretty predictable game. We added these hirelings in and it's complete chaos, completely unpredictable, adds so many different levels and layers to the strategy that I'm really excited to continue to explore it. Now, this was just our experience. And certainly let me know if you've had a different one at two players. I wanna hear all about the two player experience. I'm really interested now in exploring two player route as as a topic on this channel so if you like this let me know and if you have some recommendations on setups i'm interested in looking into the other hirelings i'm interested in looking into how do i add an insurgent faction in with a militant faction and hirelings are there some combos that will actually work while not officially supported is there something out there that i can do to create that 
feeling of having this really unique insurgent faction in with the militant and having hirelings kind of fill out and check the board. I'm also interested in the landmarks as well. Has anyone out there had any success in adding landmarks in? What are the right combos? I wanna explore all of that. And if you want me to explore all of that and you like this content, let me know. I, I'm, I'm excited to go further on it if you wanna see it. Either way, if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. Maybe think about liking, subscribing, I don't know. Otherwise, have yourself a good week. Take it easy.